Hello and welcome to Hands-On Website Design for Kids. I'm very happy that you've decided to join us today. My name is Chris Eust from Homeschool Programming. I've listed a bunch of contact information below, my email address, website, and so on. And you're welcome to contact me after the presentation if you have any follow-up questions. And I'll list these links again at the end of the presentation. So what we're going to do today is actually a recorded version of a live workshop that I would normally give at a homeschool convention or other type of online venue. Because many people have not been able to attend those live events or those other online seminars, I've decided to go ahead and record the presentation so that you can view it at your convenience. Now let's go ahead and get started. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, this is all about website design. So we're, we're going to talk about websites and how they work. We're going to describe the web pages and how they're formed on your computer. And we're going to spend most of our time in a hands-on web page demonstration. So we're actually going to create a little website here on the fly. And you can see how the process works and even do it on your own. I'll spend a couple of minutes at the very end introducing our Kid Coder and Teen Coder programming curriculum. And I'll tell you again how to follow up with me if you have any other questions. Normally during a live presentation, I would take questions throughout the presentation and have a, a fun interactive event. Uh, but since this is a recording, if you think of any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. All right, so who am I and why am I here giving you a presentation on website design? Well, I have been a software engineer for many, many years and I have a master's degree in electrical engineering. So I've been doing this sort of thing for quite some time. Now my wife and I are homeschool parents of two boys, and so we have a pretty good idea of what kids like to do. And perhaps most importantly, I am the co-author of eight different textbooks that teach kids and teens how to write computer programs. So I've got a lot of experience working with kids and explaining technical concepts to them in a manner that they can understand. Now if I'm a co-author, that means there's someone else out there that's responsible for these books as well. And that person is my wife, Andrea. So she is actually the owner of our business and the inspiration for a lot of what we do. So I'm actually working for her and it's a lot of fun. And I'm not just saying that because she's standing here over my shoulder. It is actually a good experience to work with your spouse. So I certainly recommend it if you get a chance. Okay, parents. So if you're sitting here, this is probably a common complaint for you. You say, my kids are spending too much time on their computer and I, I feel your pain. Like I said, I've got these boys and it's really hard to pry them away. So what we're all about as a company is trying to turn some of that playtime into a more productive learning time. We really want to teach the children the skills that they're going to need to survive in this digital age and we want to build talents that might be a lifelong passion, a hobby, or a career. We're really excited about the software engineering job market. It is hot today. It's projected to be hot for the next decade. So if this is a field that your kids are thinking about entering, we would certainly encourage it. Okay, so the big question you're probably asking is, can my kids actually do this? Can my kids write their own websites? And I've got a quote here from Arthur C. Clarke that says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's actually true for, for many, many people dealing with computers. I've talked with lots of parents over the years, and some of them refer to Internet Explorer as E with the circle thingy through it, or they talk about the Mac OS Finder as the thing with the split face on their computer screen. And parents, if that describes you, that's okay. Uh, website design is really not magic, and learning HTML and website design is really an easy way to get started in computer science. The kids are going to get some immediate visual feedback, and the tools and technologies involved are very simple to pick up, and that's what we're going to demonstrate today. Now, this is actually going to be a, a somewhat technical, hands-on demonstration. So parents, if you think your eyes might glaze over a little bit, then it's okay to let your kids elbow you out of the way and push you off to the side and then plop your kids here in front of the computer, and I'll be showing them really how to do the things that they're interested in doing. So here's my quick 30-second slide on how websites work. So when you're sitting in front of your computer and you're surfing on the internet, you've got you here on the left and you've got some sort of computer like a laptop or a desktop or maybe even a smartphone or a tablet and you're going to send a request out over the internet for some information and that request is carried through the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP 
and it goes through this internet cloud. There's a lot of mystery there. Sometimes the cloud is dark and stormy and full of problems, and sometimes it's a nice puffy white cloud that is very easy to use. But at any rate, when that request reaches a web server sitting out there across the internet, it's going to think about it for a minute and then send you back a response over the internet. And that response comes in the form of HTML. And so HTML is what your web browsers are going to understand. So running on your computer, you've got a web browser like Internet Explorer or Mozilla Firefox or Google Chrome or Apple Safari. If you're on a handheld device or a tablet, you've got some sort of embedded web browser as well. Now on the server side, there's a wide range of technologies involved in creating these HTML pages and sending them back. But for learning purposes, we can really skip over all of that server side technology and just focus on the HTML pages that are going to be on your computer. So what do you actually need on your computer in order to learn HTML? Well, you need you, you need a computer, and you need some basic computer skills. So I'm going to assume, as a computer user, you already know how to interact with your operating system. You should already know basically how to pull up your Windows Explorer program or your Mac Finder program and navigate through some of the files and directories on your system, and how to use a basic text editor. Once you have those basic computer skills, which most people already have, you just need some instructions and some tools of the trade. And most importantly, you need some enthusiasm. So when we teach computer programming or website design to kids, this is not something where mom and dad are really twisting their arm and forcing them to do extra work. Instead, we want this to be your favorite class or your favorite activity of the day. So a little bit of enthusiasm does go a long way. Okay, so let's talk about the tools of the trade very briefly. So in order to create or edit HTML on your computer, you can use a plain text editor like Notepad or TextEdit. And those two things come built into your Windows or your Mac operating system. So you don't really have to install anything new at all. You can also find some other free text editors such as Komodo Edit that have a few more features. Or you can even pay money for things like Adobe Dreamweaver or Microsoft Front Page. And then in order to view and test the HTML pages on your computer, again, you just need those free browsers like Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, or Apple Safari. So you can see you really have everything you need to get started between your free text editors and your free web browsers. Okay, so we're actually going to move away from the slides here and into a hands-on demonstration of creating a simple web page. And we'll be using tools like Notepad and Mozilla Firefox. Okay, we've now switched away to my desktop and I'm going to guide you through the creation of a simple web page from scratch. Now I'm going to be using Microsoft Windows, but you can do basically the same thing from your Mac operating system as well. So I'm going to start by bringing up Windows Explorer. So this is not your Internet Explorer web browser, but Windows Explorer or File Explorer on Windows 8 is what lets you navigate through the different files and directories on your operating system. And on a Mac computer, your Finder application would let you do basically the same thing. Now I'm going to start out and pick a directory to do all of my work in. So let's go to my C drive. I'm going to pick Kid Coder, Beginning Web Design, and My Projects. Now there's nothing magic about this directory. This is just kind of what we use for our normal students. And so that's what I'm going to use for this demonstration. But you can store your work anywhere that you like on your hard drive. Now, normally I would take suggestions from the audience and kind of build up a website interactively from scratch based on those suggestions. But since this is a recording, I have the luxury of picking my own topic. So we're going to do funny pets today. And when you want to create a website, your first step really is to create a directory that's going to hold all of your work. So inside my projects, I'm going to create a directory and I'm going to call it funny pets. And to start with, there's nothing at all inside of this directory. Now to create a web page, you actually want to make HTML files. And these are files with a .html extension. So I'm going to go ahead and create one now. And I'm going to call it index.html. And notice how I delete off the txt extension. You want to have a file that ends with .html and not .txt or any other extension. 
Now, index is just a common name for the home page of a website. So if you go to some server computer on the internet and you ask for their home page, typically it's going to be serving you index.html. And so that's what we've called our website here. Now, HTML pages are just text files, and we can edit these text files with the Notepad or the Mac OS text edit software that comes built into your operating system. So there's nothing new that you have to install. Okay, I've brought up Notepad here on my Windows computer, and I'm going to open this index.html file. I'll say File, Open, and I'm just going to navigate to my Kid Coder, Beginning Web Design, My Projects, Funny Pets, change it to all files and then select index.html now as you can see this page is completely blank so we're starting from scratch now when you want to create a web page your web page is going to contain a mixture of the content that you want the user to see as well as the HTML tags that make the web page behave the way that you want to now in HTML, all of your special HTML tags are going to be surrounded by angle brackets. So I'm going to start with an opening tag, opening angle bracket, HTML, and a closing angle bracket. So this is what we call an opening tag. And I've increased the font size here, so hopefully you can see it better on the recording. Now in HTML, when you open a tag like this, you always want to close it. And to close a tag, you start with a forward-leaning slash, and then the same tag name again, HTML. So this is a basic pair of tags that form an element in HTML. And the two tags that always go inside of HTML are a head. So I'm going to open it, and again close it, and the body. Open with the body, and again close with the body. So the pattern that I'm showing here is a common pattern that you should find on most websites that are out there on the internet. Now these containers or these tags actually form little boxes you can picture in your mind, maybe containers in a refrigerator, where inside of these boxes you might find additional boxes or additional containers, and if you keep digging in far enough, eventually you'll find some food or some drink or something interesting in one of these boxes. So they have a container relationship you can see the outer HTML tag contains inside of it both a head and a body. And inside each of these head and body areas, again, you can have other pieces of information. Now, what goes into each of these head and body areas? The head is kind of like the brains of your web page. And much like the thought processes that go in your own mind, you can't really see anything that's going on in the head. And in fact, the only visible element that we can put in the head is a title. So let me go ahead and do that. Open it with a title. And the title of the page is going to be Funny Pets. Again, close it, close it with an ending tag. And so you can see I have an opening tag, title, Funny Pets as the content, and then a closing tag. And this HTML markup tells your web browser to put Funny Pets as the title of your browser. So let's save this file. File, save. And by saving this file, the file here on my hard drive has now been modified. And to view it in a web browser, I can simply double click on it. Now when you double click on an HTML file from your Windows Explorer or your Mac OS Finder, it's going to launch the web browser that your operating system has as the default for your HTML files. In my case, that happens to be Mozilla Firefox at the moment, but you might see Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or Apple Safari, depending on what you have installed on your system. Now you'll notice there's absolutely nothing here in the content area. That's because I have nothing in the body yet. However, if you look up at the title, you can see Funny Pets. So we have changed the way the web browser will display the title of the page to the user. So now let's switch back to my index.html file and see what else we can do. Now as I mentioned, all of the visible content is going to go inside of the body. So I'm going to give us a little bit of room to work here. And then let's add something in. We're going to call this my best funny pets 
stories and pictures. All right. So I'm going to save this file, save. I can come back over here to my web browser and you can double click on that file again if you want to from your file system or most web browsers will let you refresh just by hitting F5. So I've refreshed and now you can see we're actually seeing some content show up here in the body and that's because in my index.html file I've put some sort of content in the body. Let's go ahead and add another line to my page and we're going to add a second line that says my pets do the crazy craziest things all right I'm going to save this file save come back over here and refresh and now you're going to notice something a little bit unexpected in our file these two sentences are on different lines but in the web browser they're all crammed together and if you'll notice as I resize the web browser it will automatically wrap things to a different line when there's not enough space so what's going on here well a web browser by default is going to ignore what we call white space and white space is that invisible stuff at the end of your line like a carriage return or a line feed that would move content to a new line it will also typically ignore spaces and tabs and things like that so the web browser is going to display content as best it can to fit your window unless you give it some additional directions and those directions can come in the form of HTML tags so let's go ahead and add a new tag here for a demonstration let's do a headline so we're going to wrap this first sentence as a headline h1 headline 1 we'll come out here to the end and we'll close it out give us a little bit of space and we're going to save this and come back over here and refresh alright now this page looks pretty different right the text that we wrapped inside of this h1 element is now shown in big bold letters on its own line and so that's what the h1 tag will do is it will create a headline for you and this is very similar to a headline that you might find on a newspaper article or a column let's go ahead and add a third line check out these links and we want these lines to be broken into two different lines so one way we can do that instead of putting it in a headline is we can add a BR element BR now a BR stands for break and this just inserts a new line it forces the web browser to move the text to a new line and because there's no content inside of these tags you can actually do what's called a self-closing form and we just do the opening tag name angle bracket BR a space and then we do the closing slash and a closing bracket and so this is just kind of a marker that tells the web browser go ahead and wrap this text to the new line regardless of how much space is available so I'm going to save that move over here and check out the results so you can see that even though there's a lot of space off here to the right when the web browser sees that little invisible BR symbol it will wrap the text to the new line so you'll notice that the things that are inside of your brackets give the browser some guidance as to how to display the text but they're not actually showing up here on your page itself now we can do some additional things with some additional HTML tags let's try to turn some text bold and to do that I'm going to open up I'm going to say strong and close it so here's an opening tag that says strong and I'm going to come way over here and I'm going to close it out forward slash strong and save it so now anything that is inside of the strong tags is going to appear in bolder text let me go ahead and increase the size here a little bit there hopefully we can see that better so now you can see my pets do the craziest things and craziest things is displayed in bold you can also put things in italics we use EM for emphasis always close it save come over here and refresh and you can see that check out these links is now in italics so with some pretty simple HTML markup 
you can guide the display of texts on your page. Now another common thing that you will find on a web page are lists. So let's go ahead and show you how to create a list. Now you can do what's called an unordered list and that's abbreviated UL for an unordered list. So I'm going to open the list and I'm going to close it again. Now in between the opening and closing tags we want to have some list items. LI opens up a list item and so what should we have on a page about pets doing crazy things? So let's say dumb dogs li and we're closing it out. Let's do another list item. Strange cats. And finally perky birds. So you can see what I've done here is I've created a list. This is going to be an unordered list and the list will have three items in it. Each of those items is surrounded by an opening by an opening li and a closing li tag. So let's save this, come back over here and refresh. Great, now you can see we have dumb dogs, strange cats, and perky birds in a list. And the list automatically has some space around it and it gains these special bullets off to the left. If you wanted to, you could change this to an ordered list, OL. And an ordered list just has numbers instead of bullets. So you can see our list is now automatically numbered. So lists are great ways to organize some of the information that's on your web page. All right, let's play with some colors for a little bit because colors are very popular and they're easy to do. You can actually change colors on any one of your elements by embedding some styles. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to one of our elements and we'll use our headline to start with and we're going to add a style to it. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So style equals color blue. So you'll notice here's my opening HTML tag and nothing inside of this tag is actually going to show up in the browser and I've added what's called an attribute. So I have a space, the word style, equals, and then in double quotes, color colon blue with a semicolon at the end. And this is going to tell the browser to make this text a blue color. And you can see the headline is now blue. We can do some additional styles as well. Let's do a background color. And I'm actually gonna do that up here on the body style equals background dash color yellow. And so what this means is that the entire body is going to have a background color of yellow. Let's come over here and refresh it. And presto, I now have a yellow web page. Now this blue text and the black text does show up pretty well against the yellow background but it's certainly possible to choose some color combinations that don't work out so well. Let's try making our headline white. And you can see the text is now white, but it's just really hard to read because we have poor contrast. And so playing with colors and getting a good mix of combinations is a fun thing that you can do. So I'm gonna come back here and change my color back to blue so we can see it. All right, that's better. So the next thing I wanna talk about is hyperlinks or anchors. Now, when you're browsing through the web, what you're doing is you're clicking on things and you're moving from page to page. So those things that you're clicking on typically are called hyperlinks or anchors. And those would show up as a, typically as underlined text if you've got a hyperlink on text. So I'm gonna come back in here and I'm going to add a hyperlink. And what we're gonna do is we're going to create a hyperlink for each one of these list items that would lead the user somewhere else within our website. So a hyperlink starts with an A tag and then we use an attribute called href, href equals and then we want to give it the location of the web page that we want to go to. And we're going to call this dogs.html. I'm going to close it and so this is my opening tag 
and this tells the web browser anytime somebody clicks on this link I want you to go to the dogs.html page and then the content is going to be the dumb dogs we'll close it out with a slash a and so here's our opening tag here's our closing tag and here's the content inside of the link so as you can see as we create a more and more complex web page there's going to be a lot more of these arcane HTML symbols floating around and when you're just getting started you might look at a page like this and be a little bit overwhelmed by all the tags that are here but as soon as you get into the swing of things and you start recognizing tags you'll be able to read this a lot more naturally in your mind and understand how the page is going to be laid out so let's save our changes come back over here and refresh and now you can see dumb dogs is actually a different color and it's underlined in blue and by the way I should say I do have a pair of dogs myself and I speak with a position of authority when I say there's a lot of dumb dogs out there not that all dogs are dumb but some of them are now just because I have created a link to a page called dogs.html doesn't mean that page actually exists out there on the internet so if I was to click on this now I would get an error message it tells me there's no such file I can't find dogs.html if you come back over here and you look in my file system you'll see indeed there's no dogs.html so that's something I would need to create by hand as a second page with additional content so instead of linking to a page that doesn't exist let's try linking to a page that does so let's go back to our index.html instead of dogs.html which doesn't exist I'm going to put in the full web address of something that I know is there so now we're going to go to http colon slash slash www.akc.org slash breeds so this is the American Kennel Club and it's a page about dog breeds I'm going to save that come back over here and refresh and now you'll notice that the link hasn't really changed other than to change color to show that I've clicked on it before but if I hover over it you can see right down here in the bottom left hand corner let me hover again you can see that the link has in fact changed and this is actually a great safety and security hint for those of you that are browsing on the web when you click on a link the text that you're clicking on means absolutely nothing so I could have described this link any way I wanted to in my HTML but the important thing is what is it linked to so if you receive an email with a link in it or you're browsing through the web and you see a line of text with a link on it that says something like free prize and if you hover over it and you look at where the link actually goes it might not go to a website that you're really comfortable with and so this is your, your big safety tip of the day when you hover over a link take a look and see where it's actually going to lead you before you click on it and most web browsers will show you where it's going to go down in the bottom left hand corner here so now we know this is going to go to akc.org and I'm going to go ahead and click on it and now I've taken myself to some external website that's all about dog breeds and if I want to go back to my page I'm just going to hit the back button so that's basically how hyperlinks work and it's very very easy to add hyperlinks not only to text if I've shown you, as I've shown you but you can also hyperlink buttons and images and other things so if you click on an image for example that can also lead you to a different web page so that's actually a great segue into talking about images so images are a lot of fun and if you're looking at a web page that has nothing but text like this it might look a little bit boring so let's figure out how to add an image to my page now the first thing we want to figure out is where am I going to get an image now you can always create an image on your own I'm not a great artist but if I do create images then I'm very confident that I own these images and it's okay for me to display them on my website if you're going to go get images online just be aware that all of those images are owned by someone and you generally need to have permission or understand very very carefully the terms of use before you do that in some sort of public website so I'm going to pull up a website called iclipart.com um, there's a lot of websites like this this just happens to be one that I like and I have a subscription to and I'm going to come in here and search for dogs and cats 
So here's an image. Actually, let's take this one. This looks like a fun one. And I want to download one of these images to my local hard drive. Now your experience for doing this will be a little bit different depending on where you find the images. I'm going to save image as and I want to save the image right into my funny pets directory in the same place as my HTML file and I'm going to call it dogs and cats and click save. So now if we come back over here and look in my Windows Explorer, you can see I have dogsandcats.png, and PNG is just a common file type that you might find on the internet. You might also find gif.gif or .jpg files. Those are also very common. But the important thing is I now have the image saved here on my hard drive, and I can refer to it from my HTML file. So what we're going to do first is we'll make this image actually part of the background. So instead of a background color of yellow, let's come back up to my body and let's say background dash image. And then we open with URL, opening parentheses, and then the file name, which was dogs and cats.png. And so what we've said is we want the background image to use this URL, which is dogs and cats.png. And because I don't have an HTTP on here or anything else, it's just going to look in the same directory as my index.html file. So let's save the changes. And come back over here to see what we've done. All right, very good. So you can see our background image is now superimposed underneath my headline and all of my other text. And it looks pretty cool. And this really didn't take a lot of effort. You'll also notice that the web browser is automatically going to repeat the image as many times as necessary to fill up your web page. And you can guide that with various and assorted commands. So you can just have a single copy of the image and you can put it in, for instance, the bottom right corner. Now this image is actually fairly distracting when it comes to viewing text and things like that on top of the image. So let's try something a little bit different. I'm going to remove the image as a background and I actually want to place the image here inside of my main content so it's actually part of the content and not a background. To do that we'll use an image tag img and then a source src equals and again the file name dogs and cats.png and we can give it a width if we want to and a height, but let's just use this default for now. And since there's no content other than that source file, again, we can use this self-closing format where there's only a single tag that is both opened and closed, and it contains all the information necessary and the attributes. So let's save this. We'll come back over here and refresh. And now you can see the image is no longer part of the background, but it's in line with the main content. And the image is so large it actually makes me scroll up and down to see the whole page. Let's come back over here and shrink this image down a little bit. If we take a look at the image on our file system, we can see the dimensions are 399 by 400 pixels. So it's roughly a square that's 400 by 400 pixels wide. If I want to change the width and the height in the browser, I can add in a width. Let's do 100 pixels, px for pixels, and height also 100 pixels. And this will tell the browser to shrink that image down to this size. Refresh. Okay, now I've got an image that's much, much smaller, and it doesn't take up most of the page. Now if you want to, you can actually stretch or squish the image as well. I could do a width of 200 and leave the height at 100. And this is kind of like a, one of those uh, carnival mirrors in a fun house that will stretch an image. So you can see the image is now 200 pixels wide, but still only 100 pixels tall. So you can shape the images however you like. Now there's many, many more styles that we could use to do different things on this page. 
We can apply borders to different elements. We could make it so that when I hovered over one of the hyperlinks, the hyperlink changed. I can show you those two things real quick. Uh, but there's many, many more things that you can do. And as you're learning your HTML skills, you know, having the training or the instructions to figure out what these things do and how to apply them to your web page is very important. So I'm going to come back over here and just demonstrate a simple border, and we'll do that on our list. Again, I'm going to add a style element, style equals border, and we're going to give it two pixels solid red. So I've told, told the web browser that around my entire list element, I want a two pixel wide solid red border. Refresh, and here we go. We now have a border that's two pixels wide and it covers the entire list element. Let's change the hyperlink styles very quickly. So you can add styles to individual elements as I have shown you here. And that means in this example, the border is only going to be applied to this one list element. Or you can come up here into your head area and actually define rules that govern how your entire page is going to operate. So let's do that very quickly. So we're going to add some style rules up here into our head, head page. What we want is all of our hyperlinks A to follow certain set of rules and so I've done that with an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace and then the name of the tag A out here in front and now any of these styles that we place inside will impact all of the hyperlinks on the page. So let's start off and just say color green. Let's save that, come back over here and you can see that my hyperlinks are now green. Now the browser actually understands whether or not you're hovering the mouse over the particular link or not, and you can add a different style called a hover style. So again, it's an A hyperlink, but then you add a colon hover, H-O-V-E-R, and again, your curly braces opening and closing. And we can make it a different color, color gray. So what the style rule says is anytime there's a hyperlink or an A on the page, by default its color is going to be green, but if the user is hovering the mouse over it, let's make it a gray color. Let's refresh. So I don't see anything different to begin with, but you can see as I hover my mouse over it, now it turns to a gray color. So you can completely control the behavior of your hyperlinks and choose colors and styles that match the overall theme of your website. So the one last thing I wanted to show you that's kind of fun is actually embedding videos. And it's very popular these days to embed videos from uh, YouTube or other websites. And YouTube makes it very easy. So I'm going to pull up a YouTube video here. Okay, so I've gone over to YouTube, I searched for funny pets, and I found a video that was safe. And now I want to actually embed this in my web page. So unlike the image, I'm not going to save this video to my hard drive. I'm just going to put some HTML code into my page that lets the YouTube player appear with this video. So I clicked on the in share and then embed, and you can see there's a bunch of HTML here. So you can just select all of it and copy. You don't have to understand any of it, but just copy it and come down into the page, and let's put it down here at the bottom where we want it. And go ahead and wrap this across a couple of lines so we can see it. So we're adding in a video frame with a width and a height and a particular source. Now notice I also added an HTTP colon at the front so if it gives you a source that doesn't have that HTTP on the, on the beginning of it go ahead and add it so this is a valid URL. So let's save that and come over here and refresh and you can see that we now have a video that's embedded into our page. Now the size is fairly large. So what I want to do is come back over here to YouTube and shrink this down a bit. So I'm going to choose the 560 by 315. It's going to give me those different parameters here. And I can copy. Come back over here. And just replace it. 
So now my video is only going to be 560 pixels wide. Let's come back to our page and refresh. All right, the video is now a more manageable size, and you can actually play this video, and it's going to play not from your website, but from the YouTube website. So YouTube is a great way to host videos that you don't want to put on your own web server, but you can still embed them in the page very easily like this. So there's a lot of fun that you can have with pictures, with graphics. Um, we have not even talked about animation and sound effects, but there's, there's all sorts of things that you can do with your web page, and we do cover those quite a bit in our Kid Coder Beginning Web Design and Advanced Web Design courses. In fact, I can show you very briefly the final projects for those courses. So what we're looking at now is the final project for the beginning web design. This is the, a website that we've built all about raptors. So you can see we've got some great colors and pictures and headlines and styles. We have animated hyperlinks along the side with some custom bullets and lists in the middle. It's actually a multi-page website that will take you to different pages where we've, we've taught you how to do photos and captions. There's a chapter on creating tables, so you can create tables that will compare things. So there's, there's a lot more that you can learn, and in a single semester you can come up with a web page that looks really quite professional. Now what I've pulled up is the Aquamaniacs website that the students will be working on in our second semester. So you can see again we have many, many more special effects that we've added. We've taught the students how to do a cool drop-down dynamic menu. There's also some multimedia effects with gradients. There's embedded video and sound. We teach you how to do the little pop-up citations and annotations, as well as some different animations and some JavaScript. So there's a lot of fun that can be had with websites. And again, the cool thing is you can do all of this just with some simple free tools that come on your computer. So the very last thing I wanted to show you is actually a trick if you're looking at anybody else's website. So let's just go back to one of the websites that I had linked here. And let's just say you're looking at a public website and you see something cool that you're wondering, how did they do that? How did they actually write the HTML to create these effects? Well, what you can do is actually just right click on the page and select View Page Source. Every browser will let you do this. Um, some browsers have slightly different names for these things, but it's all basically the same thing. And now you can see I've got a window that actually shows me all of the source for the web page that I'm looking at. And for these large websites, sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming because there's just there's many, many HTML tags that go into making the effects that you're seeing. But again, as you get used to things, you can look and start picking out some particular elements that are familiar, like you know what an HTML element is you know basically what belongs in the head, you know what a title does, and if you scroll on down far enough you'll see the body and the beginnings of the body text. So this view source is something that works on just about every web page and it's a great and it's an entertaining way to kind of dig in and see how people are actually doing certain things. So this concludes the hands-on demonstration part of the workshop, and I hope you learned uh, quite a bit from it. These are, again, these are all things that you can do yourself just by pulling up Notepad or text edit on your computer and typing out these commands, and you can play with these results. If you want more formal training on how to do this with step-by-step -step guidance, we do offer our beginning and advanced website design courses, so we certainly encourage you to check those out. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed that hands-on demonstration of how to create your own web pages, and I hope you're excited about computer science, because we sure are. So homeschool programming as a business provides computer science curriculum for students. We serve homeschool students, we've served educational co-ops, as well as public and private schools. So the great thing about our courses is that they're all self-study, and there's no teacher expertise required. So again, if mom and dad are off snoozing in the corner here, and the kids are bouncing up and down in their seats, leaning forward with their nose pressed against the window, that's okay. Mom and Dad don't have to be involved unless they really want to. All of our courses are self-paced with hands-on activities that you're going to complete on your own computer. We actually have four different course tracks that teach some different technologies to different age groups, and what we focused on today 
was the beginning web design course up in the top left hand corner. So we covered a very small subset of the topics that you will learn in that first semester beginning web design course. And then if you want to, you can continue on to the second semester of advanced web design. And if you decide you're more interested in some of the other subjects, such as Windows and game programming or Java and Android programming, that's fine. You can always start with the first semester course in any one of these course tracks. And we're going to teach you all the required skills from the ground up. I just wanted to show you a brief picture of our beginning web design and advanced web design textbooks. So when you order our products, you actually get physical textbooks and CDs in the mail. So these are yours to keep and share among your family members as needed. Now again, during a live presentation, I would normally set aside quite a bit of time for questions and answers because there's usually quite a bit of things that will come to your mind as you're sitting out there in the audience. So, since this is a recording again, I do encourage you to send questions to me if you have them. My email address is chris at homeschoolprogramming.com. You can also go to our main website at homeschoolprogramming.com and click on the Contact Us button in the top right corner, and those messages will come to me. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. So I encourage you to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. You can sign up for our periodic newsletter from the homepage on our website. And we look forward to working with you as your students are pursuing their computer science skills. Thanks for watching.